Good morning and happy Sabbath. And, and like Richard said, thank you so much for choosing to come this morning. I know that many of you uh, have options and uh, there are places to go and people to see. And, and uh, uh, you, you undoubtedly heard my request for you to be here last Sabbath when I said that was day three. This is going to be about day four of creation. So I have to start with a quiz before I give it over to Annika <laughs> To begin, how many of you, without looking, no peeking, how many of you know what was made on day four of creation according to Genesis chapter one and two? Okay, I heard it. Sun, moon, and stars. Okay, so now you know what today is about. So it's going to start there. Annika. Nice to have you with me today. I know your dad is very proud. How many of you knew Annika 30 years ago? Well, sorry, you shouldn't have known her. How many of you knew her parents before? How many of you were part of the entourage that Richard said swooped her up when she was four months old and have loved her ever since? I'm seeing, okay, there, there they are. Okay, all right. Some of the old ones, they, they must not be here. <laughs> okay. All right. So Annika and her sister have been part of our church for a long time now. She went away. How many of you are back from college? Okay. Raise the hand. Okay. So you're back from college. All right. How many of you go to College of the Canyons? Yeah. Whoop, 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 whoop. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Thanks for raising. That was a shout out just to you, Jay. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll take one too. Yeah, that's very kind of you. Well, I wasn't sure. Yeah, no, that's very kind of you. Um, Annika went to Williams. I'll let you look that up another time. And that is on the East Coast. And so um, she wasn't around for a lot of the time in her educative experience. However, I have great respect for what she did while she was there. And um, she is going to share a little bit of that with you right now. You can, yes. Okay. Uh, (laughs) So when I was in college, I studied English and religion, and that is probably going to be clear in what we're talking about today. I didn't know the religion part, by the way, when I asked her to speak with, to do, (laughs) so this has been a really fun conversation, (laughs) and you're going to enjoy it. (laughs) Um, Yeah, that's why I have my my stack of resources here. Um, But Mike wanted us to start with a poem. Yes. Um, by Dylan Thomas, some of you may have heard it. It's taught in pretty much every high school English class at some point or another. Um, Do not go gentle into that good night. Familiar? Anybody? I see nodding. Raise raise the hand. Yeah. You've you've heard this poem? Okay. It's popular to teach because it's got a a common rhyme scheme, partly. Um, So it's easy to teach. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I am going to read one particular stanza. um, First two stanzas, actually. So the poem goes... Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. The wise men at their end know dark is right. Because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. And then the poem ends again with the refrain, do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. This was important to you in your educative experience. Mm -hmm you decided that it would be something that you would want to uh, remember. Uh, so you have immortalized that and, <laughs> and uh, in, in a way that your generation likes to do. Yeah, and, I have and, a tattoo uh, is what he's referring to from the poem. It's so cool. He really and <laughs> I'm going to say that that shows that you have decided that this attitude that is expressed here by Dylan Thomas is something that has affected you and that you have thought about and that you are interested in telling other people about. Now, in our discussion, you talked about the fact that this poem is often thought of as dark. Yes, I think that's true of a lot of poems that deal with life being temporary. They tend to be considered dark poems, sad poems, a little bit macabre. Um, I don't agree in the case of this particular poem and probably some other poems that deal closely with death because usually when a poem is talking about death or the temporariness of life, um, what's really being considered there is 
I guess what that means for the way you should live your life. Um, so in the case of this poem, for example, it's, it's sort of a call to make the most of life while you have it and also not to resign yourself to its end in a way that ends life before it ends, I guess. I so I, I jumped off of that with the idea that we have today of the fact that here in day four of creation, we have God creating lights, and in this case specifically lights to rule the day, the sun, and lights to rule the night, the moon and the stars. And, and it was Annika who came up with the idea that this is the second time that God creates light. Why? Did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's do. Okay. Uh, Genesis. Turn to Genesis if you have that on your phone. Remember, this this pastor likes you to have things on your phone if you don't have pages in front of you. By the way, uh, the thing that you need to know about the guy household is that they have books. So if you see lots of books, these are three different versions of the Bible that she brings with her because she likes the breadth of discussion and also expression. Yes. Read, let's read that. Um, okay. This is... Start from this part? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, this is kind of an unusual translation. It's by Robert Alter. Same concept. Pretty. It's literary. Uh, it's poetic. So it starts, uh, Genesis 1.1. When God began to create heaven and earth, and the earth then was well-turned waste and darkness over the deep, and God's breath hovering over the waters, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and it was evening and morning, the first day. So you have God, and as we noted by bringing together Genesis 1 with John chapter 1, you have God in his totality, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, because John is writing about Jesus, who is the Christ or the Messiah or the one who was to come. He's writing about the fact that he was there at creation. He was part of Elohim, which she learned in the Hebrew that she learned at, at, at school, uh, is plural. So God in his wholeness, in his community, dare I use the word God in his community, was there at creation and did the creating. And so the Jesus that we know, you didn't know that you were coming to a university lecture this morning, the Jesus that we know, the Christ, the incarnation of God into humanity was also before part of the same God who does the creating and the very first thing that he does is he separates darkness from light. Then, as we discussed, he does something on the fourth day. Yeah, so on the fourth day, he creates the moon, stars, and the sun, um, and he places them in the vault of the heavens to light up the earth and to have dominion over day and night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, evening and morning, fourth day. So we were, I don't know, we sort of spent a little bit of time just sitting and cogitating on that because mm -hmm. you essentially have God doing the same job twice. He divides light from darkness himself. When he creates light, he separates them. And then he does it again when he creates the sun, moon, and stars. And he uses a particular word. He uses the word dominion and or rulership. And that the sun ends up being the ruler of the day and the moon and stars are the ruler of the night. And so there's this, this distance. And then I, I, I threw out at her the concept which you know, strains, it strains my idea, because I said last week that, you know, I'm not so much into this yin-yang thing, this light-darkness combination that should live forever. I'm not into that theology. But then I also thought, how many of you, uh, like me, would think, uh, what was the first part of Sabbath in creation week? 
the night, the night. Because the, the rhythm that you hear in creation week is the evening and the morning, the evening and the morning. Uh, I, I like to think of it as the best wedding present ever. Adam and Eve, we believe they're created together on the sixth day. That's coming up in a couple of weeks. What is their first night together? Their first day together begins with the night. It begins with rest, rest. What did you do last night? I hope you didn't stay up all night. You rested. So the very first part of Sabbath is the night. It's ruled by the moon and stars and it's rest. I, I don't know. Do you, do you like that? Does that factor into your picture of the God of creation and his relationship to his, his creation? I think it's a pretty wonderful concept and one that we can grab a hold of when we talk about being seventh day people. Okay? I was talking to a non-observant Israelite yesterday. I say that very specifically. He is from Israel, so I call him an Israelite. And I was, I ended, I'll just say, I ended the conversation by saying Shabbat Shalom. And when can you say Shabbat Shalom? Legally in Israel, you can say Shabbat Shalom beginning Thursday night in anticipation of the day that is coming. But Friday night, I say Shabbat, the peace of the Sabbath be with you. Interesting that the day, the, 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 the night that Dylan Thomas is talking about, raging against the night, uh, doing everything that you can before the night comes. Maybe, maybe like you said, um, this idea of talking about day four doesn't work as much with the thought that Dylan Thomas had. No, I don't think it does, actually. Um, and I think that that arguably even the, the scripture today, right? Mm -hmm. um, Come with me and you'll walk in light. Mm -hmm. Never walk in darkness. And even that theme almost feels like it's a little bit intention or a little bit different than what you see in, in Genesis, at least mm -hmm. the beginning of Genesis and the sort of the creation story. Mm -hmm. um, because initially what you have is not a prioritization necessarily of light over darkness. It's a separation of light and darkness, a creation cool. of light, which does in a way hinder darkness, at least within its own space. Mm -hmm. But the darkness is never erased. Um, it's never eradicated. And I think what's really interesting about the fact that God does it twice is the second time he does it, he complicates both light and darkness. It's the first time, yes. right? He separates light and darkness. Yeah. Not super a lot of detail there. Genesis is pretty concise in that way, very laconic. It leaves out details. But as far as we know, at that point, you have light and you have darkness. They're sort of discrete. Uh, they might be attached to each other, might be next to each other, bump up against each other. Mm -hmm. But they're not mixing. They're not intermingling. Uh, they're two separate discrete entities, things, mm -hmm. um, states of being, perhaps. Uh, but then you get the sun, moon, and stars, right? And so when you get the moon and stars, those are put in the night sky. Mm. They bring light to darkness. Like he's poked holes in the darkness. Exactly. Yeah. He's added light to darkness. And I think with the way that we now often symbolize light and darkness, with light being good, darkness being bad, darkness tends to represent fear, unknown, mm -hmm. lots of things mm -hmm. that we shy away from. Light represents knowing, nobility, seeing, brightness, good things. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's almost tempting to stop the conversation there and go, you know, God makes light and dark, and then, well, he doesn't make light and dark. Mm -hmm. Yes, he does. Yeah. Um, and then on day four, he makes sure that there's still light and darkness, so it's never fully dark on earth. Mm -hmm. And that's one argument. But I think what's interesting, mm -hmm. and when I said this yesterday, Pastor Mike gave me a very, <laughs> he's like, what are you doing kind hold, of look. Hold on to your Sabbath half on this, okay? <laughs> Here we go. Um, and then he makes the sun, too. And before the sun, presumably light is just everywhere that it touches. It's all. But then he makes a single light source for Earth during the day. It's one. And the significance of that is that if you have a single light source shining on an uneven surface, roll with me on physics here, 
you're going to have shadows, right? We, we know this intuitively. We learn why it is in physics. You took physics, right? <laughs> I did, once. <laughs> you, do you understand what she's saying? That if I block the light onto the pulpit here, what does it create? It creates a shadow, okay? Uh, a, a lunar eclipse, a solar eclipse creates a shadow. It makes the day go dark when the moon comes in front of the sun. So this is what you're talking about. What, what is this thought that you're having? So I think that this is interesting, and I think that this is significant because it means that once you have the sun, moon, and stars all put in place, neither light nor dark, day nor night, is ever unmediated by the other. Um, they're always is mixed, is the easiest way to say that. They're always wrapped up in each other, part of each other. They're never really fully separate, discrete things. Um, they always interact. They always interfere. Um, and I think that that's really interesting, too, because so something that Mike suggested, we were talking about, you know, kind of, what does this mean? <laughs> Why do we care? Why does it matter um, that day always has night and night always has day? Is that God is ruler of all, mm. right? That, you want to go with that? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to say, he, he gives us the sun, he gives us the moon, he gives us these things to signify himself. You can look at the fact that your life might seem, might seem very separate. You're, you, you might seem uh, very different from those around you, but the realization that God makes you or that God has you in his world that he created, when you come up with that realization in your life, you realize that, that there is no place, like several of the prophets have said, there is no place where you can go that God doesn't know that you're there. Okay? He, know, he knows you, he knows every hair on your head, or, or, or new hairs in the case of Jill, uh, thank God. Uh, you know, he, he, he gives you that feeling of, I am with you. Now, uh, there are many who have written about the son of righteousness. And we can talk about that. We can talk about the motifs. Uh, uh, motifs are, are ideas that come from things that we look at. And we can say that the sun, S-O-N, has risen... Anyone know the rest of the text? With healing in his wings. The sun has risen with healing in his wings. And you have this ability then to, to, to realize that when we see the sun, which God creates on the fourth day, he, has, he, he, is, he is saying to us, here am I, I have given you the single source of light, but... I have also given you the moon and the stars at night. And I don't know if you remember Abraham and his conversation with God, and God takes him out not in the middle of the day, he takes him out into the middle of the night, and he points out the myriad of stars. He, he makes him look at the Milky Way. And, and he says, can you count the stars? And, and, and Abraham says, no. Did you know that last evening I had the opportunity to remind my Israelite friend of the blessing that God gave through Abraham and that it is still possible to be part of that blessing? So here on the fourth day, we, like Abram of old, can look up into the sky and say, you know what? Those stars represent the, the seed, the offspring of the people of God, the people of Abraham. And God said to Abram, they will be as many. So you can understand why Jesus was a little peeved with Nicodemus in John chapter 3 when he said, you are a teacher of Israel and you don't understand that this God of creation that you are honoring, that you are looking forward to the Messiah, this God of creation wants to save all his children. He wishes that they were 
all attached through the blessings that he brought through Abraham and his people. So you can imagine uh, uh, the reaction from my Israelite friend. Uh, oh, he says, I love all people. Because we had been speaking of his cousins, the Arabs, and you know, he is saying, people who do bad things to other people, that's, that's, I don't like those individuals. I, I, I love all people. God says, Jesus says to Nicodemus, I love all people. Look at the stars of the heaven. Can you count them? That's going to be how many children will come, how many people will come. And I, I don't know. Um, here on this fourth day of creation, uh, we have... We have these symbols, if you like, these motifs that get hung in the sky, which we take for granted. In fact, we get the SPF 50 out to protect ourselves. Okay, quick fact, how, many, how, how far away from, we, uh, from the sun are we? Hey, boy, they did listen in science class. Okay, uh, now for the really smart people, how far away from the moon? 200 and hum? 246,000 miles. Thank you, Richard. Thank, that, that's a really it's smart question. closer post. to 200,000. And, and now for the, for the really important question, what is our nearest star? There's the really smart people. The sun is a star that gets hung in the sky. It's our own personal star. Now, that might be why the wise men we're a little intrigued by the star that hung over Bethlehem. So as we look to these things that are created, we need to see that they represent what God wants us to know about him. Is that fair? They are not to be worshipped as God. Can we, can we agree on that? Really, it's the difference between pagan religion and real religion, and, and, and I'm done in, in, in a quick second here. Worship of the created, even if it's your own idea, worshiping that idea is not what God calls us to do. He calls us to worship Him who made heaven and earth. That's the first angel's message. So if you didn't think that we could connect the first angel's message with the fourth day of creation, we just did. We would call it Sunday, right? Am I bringing up some ideas in your head right now? I hope. If you think that you can come up with an idea of worship where you're worshiping the created instead of the creator, you should probably think again. And I'm saying this to my Adventist brothers and sisters, because we may just be guilty of the same thing sometimes. So let's not be guilty of worshiping the created instead of the creator. Our mantra comes from Dylan's poem. Dylan Thomas. Dylan Thomas. Don't. Do not go gentle <laughs> into do. that good night. As a Seventh-day Adventist person, how, how do you feel about the life that you are living today? Are you, are you going gentle? Or do you have problems with how things are going in your world? Or maybe in the world of the people that live around you? I don't know about you, but uh, I'm really glad they're paying better attention to my friend Pete. Because there were some a few weeks ago who didn't want to pay attention to him. Who wanted him to just go home and get hospice. But one man comes along and says, no, no, he's worth, he's worth caring about. Now, 
He may find something, church, he may find something that we don't want to hear. But I will always care for that doctor. I am praying for that doctor. Because that doctor is, is, is doing something for my friend. What about you? Uh, you've done school, you're working now. Are you happy with things the way they are? Or do you, what, do you, what do you care about? Do you, do you care about the people you're helping with English? <laughs> I'm going to say she does. <laughs> yeah. I'm you, you, have, you have this natural ability to care for people and help them. Is that something you're going to... It's going to be a part of your life? Yes. Yes. Of course. Yeah. As much as you are able. How about you guys? When you are faced with the opportunity to rage, rage against those things in this existence that we have and say, wait, wait. I need more time to do some things for some people. I need more time. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Jesus, please don't come tomorrow because I still have to help my brother. Would that not be a, a, a prayer to say, God, I love my brother. I don't want to lose him or her, my sister, my brother. Are you ready to rage against the effects of time and space in our existence so that another person, another human being might enjoy eternal life? I don't know, Dylan Thomas, he's a cool guy. I don't know that he really knew God or liked God. That would be up to the critics. Yeah, the consensus is no <laughs> on that one. He was a pretty um, fierce atheist and critic of religion. So maybe bringing up this poem is a strange thing to do. But I'm going to tell you that the sentiments of this poem really grab a hold of my heart from a godly sense. And when I see him putting a sun in the sky and, in, and a moon and stars in the sky and saying, they will rule, I'm seeing him putting his signature into our world. Every day when the sun comes up, every night when the moon comes up, it's another evidence of the fact that God is still the ruler of this world. I'm, I, I, I believe we need to, to be in awe, in awe of a God like that, a creator God. And then we have the opportunity every week when we meet people, even our coworkers who maybe we've known for a long time, maybe we'll be thrust into a situation where we'll be able to introduce them to this God. Maybe they knew, thought they knew God, but they will be able to be through you who has this new understanding of this, this God who loves us intensely that you can be introduced to that God. I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm interested in those kinds of opportunities. Are, are, are you? Are you interested in sharing a God like that? We've tried tried. We've tried to come up with some ideas for you today. Um, we're not going to conclude. We're going to just say, keep thinking. Keep, under, keep, keep looking for understanding of God where you can find it. And don't be afraid if it's a Dylan Thomas poem. Don't be afraid. The God of creation will shine through 
like the stars of the night. Amen.